So what we're gonna build is something that looks a little bit like this. I'll just run through the basics. So ECR down this bottom left is the EC2 container registry. So that's where you store all your Docker images and they basically contain your application code, your runtime dependencies, and any configuration for running that code. So you basically build that image in your build pipeline or at build time, and then you upload the image to the EC2 container registry. And that means your image is there waiting to be grabbed by ECS when it needs to provision new servers. So the next thing we have is a load balancer, uh, which we route traffic to. The load balancer would then route traffic to the application containers within your ECS cluster. Um, and then your auto scaling group, uh, which is basically what ECS will manage for you, will monitor uh, whether you need to provision new servers within your cluster. And then if it determines that you do need to do one, it'll spin up a new pre-configured Docker EC2 instance and then grab whatever image you have configured for that ECS service and then it will pull that image, drop it directly into that EC2 instance, and then the load balancer is good to start routing traffic. So that, that process of determining that it needs new servers to actually getting one live only takes one to two minutes. So it's, it's a pretty fast process to add capacity. And then again, it'll monitor for when you no longer have high load and it will start shutting down your application servers, depending on how you've configured ECS. So that's uh, how ECS integrates with the container registry. You see at the top left here, we have another subnet, which has a uh, another ECS cluster for a scheduler and another one for background jobs. This is just how we're gonna configure it. So uh, you can imagine <clears throat> one of the main issues in your traditional architecture, you could put Redis, you could put MySQL, you could write your logs to the file system. And everything's on one server, so there's no issues with doing that. That's perfectly fine. As soon as you introduce a load balancer and you have mo multiple servers serving your application traffic, you can no longer do that. If you installed Redis on each of these servers and you're using Redis as a caching layer, for example, and a client uh, routed a request to your load balancer, depending on which server your load balancer routed traffic to, you may or may not uh, have up to the most recent data in that cache or have any cache data at all. So. You want a centralized cache that all your web servers talk to. And same with the database. It would not be great if, you know, a user saved a record to the database and the load balancer routed it to the first web server and it saved in that web server's database. And then when they tried to fetch it, they got routed to this third web server and it's not in that web server's database. So we need to also split out databases and logs as well. So if, if you're trying to look at logs, you probably want a consolidated view of the logs on all your web servers. Um, so what we do here is we basically uh, split out to RDS, which is Amazon's managed database service. You could also, you know, spin up a EC2 instance and manage MySQL yourself. I find it much easier just to use a managed RDS instance from AWS. And similarly with Redis, you could spin up an EC2 and self-manage Redis but we're just gonna use the Elasticash service and have AWS manage that for us. And so what that means is our application clusters will then essentially just talk to Redis and the database. Doesn't matter how many instances we have, they'll all talk to the same instances. They will also route logs to the same uh, log group in CloudWatch, which means we'll get consolidated logging. So yeah, the this other public subnet here where we have the scheduler and the background jobs, you can imagine our containers that are serving application traffic, we only really want them to serve incoming traffic. So we only want them responding to an API or serving HTML or however we've got it configured. We just want it to be responsible for that so that as your traffic increases, you can scale the application code. Now, a lot of applications have, you know, scheduled jobs, so like uh, tasks that are run uh, via a cron job or something. And if we were to have a cron tab on inside each of these containers with scheduled jobs, we would be running the same job in parallel depending on the number of containers. So if we scheduled a job to send customers emails every morning at 9 a.m. and we happen to have 10 uh, containers running at the same time, that would send 10 emails once for each container. So we need to pull out all scheduled jobs onto a single um, separate server and have that just manage the scheduled jobs. And the same with background jobs. So a lot of applications will make use of uh, background jobs for 
async processing of things that aren't super critical. So if you have long running tasks that can happen in the background, like optimizing images or I don't know, sending invoices, any of these kind of things that don't need to happen immediately that are triggered in your system, uh, it's very common to just push those to a queue and have something process that queue as it sees fit. So again, we don't really wanna be processing a queue on each of these application servers. Not only does it mean our containers are doing multiple things, but it means that we're potentially interrupting serving real-time traffic by adding load to process our queues. And by definition, our queue jobs aren't really that time critical. So again, we're gonna uh, spin off another ECS service that's just gonna process our background jobs off our queue. So we can configure this to also scale with the number of jobs in the queue. So if we happen to have a lot of jobs pushed to the queue and we're worried that it's gonna be insurmountable because jobs are coming in faster than we're processing them, ECS can scale to make sure that never happens. But we're just gonna run it on a separate cluster. So that's what uh, this section is for. We're also gonna look at how to manage security groups between all these resources to ensure that we only have permission to access the things we actually need. So we're gonna do that via security groups and also IAM roles. And we're gonna use secrets manager and parameter store to manage the configuration and secrets of our application. So parameter store is where we'll store basically configuration for our applications. So anything that's not uh, sensitive information. So it might be, you know, like a redirect URL from a webhook, base URL of our API, you know, things like this that that are just configuration that might change depending on whether you're deploying to a pre-prod environment, a staging environment, production, local, you know, sandbox, whatever, just values that will change based on the environment that aren't sensitive. And then the secrets manager is for things like, you know, your Stripe tokens, your database passwords, anything that's uh, very secret. And ECS actually has a very, very clean integration with secrets manager. Uh, basically you build into the image a reference to the secret um, and it resolves it automatically at runtime for you. So you're never baking in any secret information into your containers. Whereas your parameters will get baked in. So when you actually um, build the images for the container registry, anything you have configured as a environment variable from parameter store will just pull down at build time and statically bake into that image. And the way we're going to put all this together is with the AWS CDK. Um, the reason we're going to use CDK is because it gives you infrastructure as code. Uh, it's also a very, very handy way to manage your infrastructure. It's my preferred way of dealing with AWS. Um, it's a bit simpler than writing CloudFormation directly. It essentially generates CloudFormation for us. Um, and CDK has some really nice constructs for managing this ECS. Um, so yeah, that's essentially what we're gonna cover in the course. Uh, we're gonna go into each of these sections in detail, but I'm gonna try and keep the course as short as possible so that you can get up and running shipping to production in ECS in as short a time as possible. Hope you enjoy it.